Thank you. It's a, it's a great joy and a great honour to be here. Um, and I know you've had a string of um, English people on pilgrimage to the Toronto Diocese, and I'm grateful to you for accepting one more English person on pilgrimage. I discovered that um, my friend Stephen Cottrell was here um, previously, so I sent him a message to say, oh, I gather you came before me at the Toronto Clergy Conference, and so he wanted to send you his best wishes um, and said what a nice time he had with you, time he had with you when he was here last. So what we're going to be doing um, over the course of today and tomorrow and then on Friday morning is just beginning to spend some time reflecting on Luke's Gospel. When we had a conversation about what would be most useful to do, and we agreed that the thing that all preachers like to do is to talk about the lectionary gospel, because it lays down some nice foundations for the next year in, and preaching. And um, we then began a conversation about, actually, you can't really do Luke's gospel in um, three to four sessions. So what will we do particularly um, that would kind of focus our attention on Luke? And we decided that one of the things that would be really interesting to do would be to look at a chapter and really focus on a chapter and reflect on um, what that chapter can teach us. So what we're going to be doing... Am I too far away from this for this to work now? It was working beautifully before. Oh, look, there I am. What we're going to be doing is having a look at Luke 15, which will be coming up in the lectionary, is the good news. Um, but what I hope you will see that we're going to be doing over the course of the next couple of days is thinking about Luke 15 in the context of a broader reflection on the nature of parables and how we understand parables. Because I'm sure you all know that one of the key things about Luke's Gospel is his storytelling and his passion for weaving a good story. So what we're going to be exploring tonight and then kind of picking up the theme of tomorrow is that whole question of how we begin to engage with the parables. So tonight our theme is inhabiting the parables. How do we become people who are better at inhabiting parables. And I hope you'll recognise that once you begin to explore this question, it weaves its way outwards into quite a lot of Luke's Gospel. So we're focusing on Luke 15, but it will be a theme that will kind of spread outwards throughout pretty much the most of Luke's Gospel as you read your way through it. So tonight, I want to set up some questions and some explorations about how we read Luke, particularly thinking about how we read Luke's parables, and what difference that might make to us in the church today. What might, difference might it make to the way in which we preach, to the way in which we talk to other people, to the way in which we reflect for ourselves? What kind of questions emerge out of that? But before I get there... Um, there's a few things I would like you to know about me, which um, Nicola didn't say, because um, there's some really significant things about what I think I'm doing when I'm doing this kind of thing. Um, for me, what's really important is that the best kind of theology only ever takes place in conversation. The problem, of course, is the way in which this kind of event is set up is that, in a way, the conversation is slightly one-sided, which is I get most of it and you only get a little bit of it. But what I do hope that you will recognise is that, for me, the really important thing that we're doing today, tomorrow and on Friday is making a space in which you do some thinking, making a space for you to do some reflection. And I want to say at the start, because it's really significant for me that I say this, that actually I'm not particularly bothered whether you listen to me or not. I'm not particularly bothered whether you listen to every single word that I say. I'm especially not at all bothered about whether you agree with me. Because one of the things that I have discovered over the course of 20-odd years in teaching is that I don't always agree with me myself. <laughs> And as I'm talking, I suddenly go, do I really think that? I'm not entirely sure. Um, so actually, if you define yourself in disagreement with me, that's absolutely fine. And you'll probably discover later on that I I'm with you as well. So don't worry about um, engaging particularly. Don't let, um, worry about agreeing with me. My purpose is to stir the pot. And as I stir the pot, for ideas to emerge for you. Um, and I will have succeeded if you go away having thoughts and new thoughts. 
And they don't have to be my thoughts. You don't have to have listened to all of my thoughts. You simply need to have thought some thoughts. So I would really like to encourage you to spend the time reflecting and exploring yourself. And if something occurs to you while I'm talking and you think, oh, I just want to go off and think about that for a moment, that's absolutely fine by me. Um, and I will be fascinated to hear the result of your thoughts later on once we come back together. Um, my most favourite thing of all is to conduct something like this as a grand conversation where you talk back to me as we go. Unfortunately, this, that doesn't work with a group this big. Um, we would not get anywhere with a group that, this big. So what I want to try and do over the course of the next few days is to begin a conversation, but recognise that actually it's going to be insufficient. So what we'll do is I'll talk for a bit, then I'll get you to talk to your neighbour um, and to begin to explore your own thoughts, and then we'll come back together and I'll talk a little bit more. But there will be time for question and answer both tomorrow morning and evening, and again, a larger panel conversation on Friday. So if there's things you want to raise, um, observations you want to make, disagreements you want to raise, then make sure you note them down and we'll make sure that there's space for them to be aired and to explore. And the most important thing, before we actually get into the subject, is that I come with an expertise. Well, actually, I come with an expertise in Paul, but I have taught New Testament for 20 years, so I kind of dabble in Luke from time to time. But you come with an expertise in ministering in Toronto. And I have none of that expertise at all. So if this is going to be at all an interesting engagement, you have to bring half of the conversation, which is your experience of ministering in Toronto. What does it mean um, in this particular context? I can't do the so what questions for you because I don't know your context. So you need to bring those. And what I hope we'll be able to do in conversation with your neighbours and then later on in conversation together in the plenary is that we'll be able to share experience from your context as well as from my context. Final, final thing, and then I really will begin. Um, and I've just forgotten what that final, final thing is. So <laughs> we'll forget that final, final thing, and then we really will begin. So, reading the parables. How do we begin to read the parables? Before we get into the parables in depth, I do just want to stop for a moment and think about discipleship. I don't know the context here, so I'm going to tell you about the Church of England, and you can see whether it fits at all with your context. But one of the really interesting things about the Church of England at the moment is that the Church of England is beginning to recognise that there's a bit of remedial work for us to do, and it's on the subject of discipleship. Um, some of you may remember um, that there was a decade, and I even forget which decade it was now, um, the decade of evangelism a while ago. And the interesting thing that kind of came out of the decade of evangelism was that it wasn't as successful as people had hoped. And as people have begun to reflect, I'm sure that's not the same here, um, <laughs> but as people began to reflect on why the decade of evangelism was not as successful as people had hoped, they began to recognise that it was because it was to a certain extent decoupled from discipleship that actually evangelism and discipleship go hand in hand. And unless you've got vibrant discipleship working, then vibrant ev evangelism simply cannot function in the same kind of way. And there's something I think really quite important to stop and think about that. So we're beginning to do some work in the Church of England on discipleship and how you craft good discipleship. The problem is that um, people aren't entirely confident that they know what good discipleship looks like. People are beginning to say, well, we know it's really important, but actually, how do we begin to shape it? How do we begin to make it make sense in our particular context? Now, one of the really interesting things, I think, is then to stop and begin to ask that question, that kind of reflective question, is what is discipleship? What does it look like? And what does vibrant discipleship look like in your context? A very, very simplistic way into that question is around this question of who disciples are. What is the definition of disciple? Now, uh, my poor husband, who's ordained, um, regularly has me test stuff out on him. Um, and you can always see that look come over his face when he comes in from a meeting. I go, so, answer me a question, will you? And he goes, oh. Um, and the question I asked him one night as he came in from his grim PCC meeting was, um, 
So what does the word disciple mean? Because I was in the middle of reflecting on this, because I just wanted to test it out with him. And he said, the, the word disciple means a follower of Jesus, um, which, of course, is not the wrong answer. <laughs> I state very carefully. The problem is, it's not exactly the right answer. And in there is one of the really important and interesting issues about discipleship. Um, he isn't on his own saying that the word disciple means a follower of Jesus. And I use him as an example because it saves me having to ask you what you think the word disciple means. The word disciple, as I'm sure you know anyway, actually technically means someone who learns, a learner. The reason why following is attached to the word disciple is that the earliest disciples of Jesus learnt through the following. So that's why it's not completely wrong, it's just not completely right. But this is where you get into the really interesting territory about the nature of discipleship. So if a disciple is someone who learns, is your community a disciple community? Is it a community in which is marked and shaped by its learning? Let me tell you a story um, which has stuck with me ever since um, the person um, raised it with me. I do a bit of work consultancy from time to time, and somebody came to talk to me because she was new into the world of theological education. She was a trainer. And she trained people in the health service, in business, in teaching. She was a, a, a classically trained trainer. She knew how to train people. And slightly unusually in the Church of England, she had been appointed to be a trainer in the Church of England, but she wasn't a theologian and she wasn't ordained. And um, within about two months, she hit a brick wall. And she came to talk to me because she couldn't understand the brick wall. And her opening question to me was, I don't understand. Isn't the church a learning environment? And I went, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Um, and her question still haunts me today. If she came into your context and said to you, is your church a learning environment? What would you say, honestly? Not the right answer, but the honest answer. And the thing that, for me, really kind of haunts me is, in all honesty, and I can say this because I'm, I'm a long way away and there's no more of our bishops here, the Church of England is not a learning environment. The Church of England is a place in which people have become comfortable and settled and ordered in their lives. And the problem in the Church of England is the word discipleship, or the word disciple, is attached to one part of the Christian experience and not the whole part of the Christian experience. And again, I can say this because I have written, I've been responsible for co-writing a discipleship course. The problem with discipleship courses is people assume, A, that you do it when you're a new Christian, and B, that having done the course, the job's a good one. So you do your discipleship course in the first year of your faith, you finish your discipleship course, go, thank goodness that's over, never have to do that ever again. And the real challenge, I think, with the whole question about discipleship is why on earth would a new Christian want to come and join in our communities and be expected to learn when they see nobody else learning, when they see nobody else engaging um, with the whole learning um, context. So that's my little rant about discipleship. Um, but it is, I think, really quite an important question. How do we become communities that are really good at learning? And the one thing I know for certain is that discipleship co courses are one tiny little brick, one tiny little strand in the world of discipleship. But don't for a moment think you will find your perfect discipleship course and all of your problems will be solved, because they won't. I know that as somebody who is a co-author of a discipleship course. Actually, all a discipleship course can do is show you the bigger, greater task 
that lies before us of being people who learn day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. So that, for me, is a kind of real passion. How do we become um, churches of disciples rather than um, people who come to church in order to sit comfortably in pews and do what we did last week and the week before? The next thing I just want to say um, about learning and the context of learning is that um, we need to recognise that teaching and learning are not the same thing. Nicola has told you I've done teaching for over 20 years now, and I know this for a fact, that teaching and learning are not the same thing. I can teach till I'm blue in the face, but learning does not automatically happen simply because I'm teaching. One of my little bugbears about higher education in England, I don't know if it's the same here, is that whenever you teach a course on higher education in England, you have to begin by saying, these are my learning outcomes. The problem is, I always want to say, I have no idea what the learning outcomes are going to be. I know what my teaching goals are, but I have simply not the foggiest idea what the learning outcomes will be. Because actually, if I am even a fraction good teacher, then the people who are in my classes will learn a hundred things that I've never even thought of. Learning and teaching are not the same. So when did the disciples learn from the one they followed? The problem that we often make when we're beginning to kind of to tie up a whole load of questions about teaching and learning and discipleship is you say, when did the disciples learn? The disciples learnt when Jesus taught. When did Jesus teach? Let's look at Jesus' teaching and we'll understand the nature of discipleship. As you will know, the disciples lived with Jesus for however many years they lived with Jesus. Let's call it three um, and be Johannine for the sake of this evening. Um, but if they um, thought about um, learning with Jesus... They learnt as they walked along, along the road, as they ate breakfast with Jesus, as they um, asked questions and got it wrong, as they saw what Jesus did, as they experienced who Jesus was, as they engaged in conversation with Jesus. That's when learning took, took place. 5% of their learning probably took place when Jesus taught. 95% of their learning took place in other ways and in other um, manners. So it is really interesting, therefore, that when we talk about discipleship, we often focus on a very, very narrow band, which is what are the things that Jesus taught to his disciples. And we have a list of things that Jesus might have taught, the content of the teaching, and that we focus on our discipleship courses. The interesting thing is that, therefore, we miss vast swathes of the learning that happened for the disciples. And one of my great passions is how do we become communities that learn from Jesus and learn from Jesus in an expansive and fascinating way rather than just a very prescriptive, um, content-driven way? So that's my big question. However, we don't have the time to answer it in the course of the next three days. What I want us to talk about over the course of the next three days is just one tiny strand of Jesus' teaching but one tiny strand that is, is actually often overlooked by a lot of people when they're looking at Jesus' teaching. So this is by way of preamble to say, I think this is a really, really important area, but let us just be very clear that what we are about to talk about is one tiny strand of a small amount of Jesus' teaching and recognise that learning took place in all sorts of other ways as well. Nevertheless, I think the parables are really interesting. I'm just kind of putting them in their context about where they fit in Jesus' teaching and learning. One of the interesting things for me about Jesus' parables is they're a completely different mode of teaching, a di completely different mode of engaging with what Jesus wanted to say. So what I want us to do um, over the course of the next couple of days is to begin to reflect on what is this mode. How can we learn something from this mode of Jesus, who is the person who taught in so many different ways, one of which being his classic teaching. One of the things you may not know about um, the very earliest church is that those outside of the earliest church recognise the earliest Christians as people who learnt through parables. It's a very, very interesting thing to notice that um, a couple of times throughout the um, texts that are written about Christians, 
they are identified as people who learnt through parables. Let me just show you an example just to give you an um, idea. Galen, you may have heard of, was one of the most famous physicians from the second century CE. And he said of Christians, it's just, you, we could spend three days on this sole quotation alone because I think it's absolutely fascinating. Most people are unable to follow any demonstrative argument consecutively. Fascinating, don't you think? Hence, they need parables and benefit from them. Just as now we see the people called Christians drawing their faith from parables and miracles, and yet sometimes acting in the same way as those who philosophize. A few things for you to know. For Galen, learning through parables was not a good idea. Galen was a philosopher. Um, he gained his kind of medical knowledge from philosophy. So for him, the best learning took place through philosophy. So you have to bear in mind that Galen's quotation here is saying, I don't get it. These people are not learning philosophy like they should be if they were decent human beings, but they're not decent human beings because they can't follow it. But apparently, they're learning a lot from the parables, but having learned a lot from the parables, they're acting like they would if they were halfway decent philosophers. So that's the kind of the context behind his quotation. And that, for me, is a really, really interesting observation, that he is slightly bemused that these early Christians seem to learn something about engagement, about inhabiting who they were, about um, how, what their actions ought to be, and they learnt them through parables, not just through philosophy. And Galen doesn't get it. He doesn't understand why it's the case. But it is the case. So I think we get into a really interesting territory at that point to say, well, actually, to what extent are we still like the, uh, these earliest Christians? Um, if you have a look at the vast majority of way in which we teach the Christian faith, it is much closer to philosophy than it is to parables. It is much closer to logical argument, to exploring ideas through kind of, kind of coherent ways of thinking rather than through parables. So my big question for the next three days, and if there's no question you take away from this other than this one, this is the big question. What would our churches be like if we learnt more from parables? What would they look like? What would they feel like? What would our sermons need to be like? Would they be sermons, in fact? What would our learning groups be like? What would our conversations be like? But what would it all be like? What would it all look like if we were closer to the earliest Christians and being people who explored through parables? That's my big question, um, and we'll loop back to it time and time again. Um, so, parables are a key, but not only... Oh, skipped on. I haven't found yet how to go back with this. It just goes forward. Hold on. Let me just... There we go. Um, and now I've completely forgotten what I was saying. <laughs> You'll gather that my brain gets distracted very easily. Um, so, but anyway, let's go back to what would our churches be like, what would our context be like if we were better at um, exploring through parables? Um, let's just kind of begin to kind of pick up that question and explore some of the kind of outcomes of that particular question. Um, Kenneth Bailey, who is, was um, the best, one of the best parable scholars around. Um, my two favourite parable scholars are Ken Bailey and Amy Jill Levine. Um, and you will hear me talking about them quite a lot over the course of the next two days. Um, in case you haven't heard, very sadly, Ken Bailey died on Monday evening. Um, so, in a way, I want to say um, that our next two days would, um, I would like to dedicate to the memory of Ken Bailey. Um, he is a remarkable scholar, um, one of a very, very few people who can talk equally about a Western context and a Middle Eastern context and bring life into the parables. Um, and if you've not read a book by Ken Bailey, now is the moment to go and read a book by Ken Bailey. He is spectacularly good. This quote comes from Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, but his other earlier books on the parables are equally good. So, after a little um, hymn of praise to Ken Bailey, let's just read his quotation. Ken says, 
Jesus was a metaphorical theologian, that is. His primary method of creating meaning was through metaphor, simile, parable, and dramatic actions, rather than through logic and reasoning. He created meaning like a dramatist and a poet, rather than like a philosopher. And placing that quote next to the Galen quote, I think is a really interesting one, because um, Ken Bailey there is agreeing with Galen to a certain extent. I can't quite decide how far I agree with him. I think he is a little bit right. Whether he's completely right, I think is up for grabs. And I've been going for a while, yes, I've been going for half an hour now, so I think the moment has come for you to exercise your brains and talk to um, the people next to you just for a moment, just to get your juices flowing. My question is, to what extent do you agree with, well, two, two questions. First question is, um, how do you react to parables? And um, when you think about parables, we'll be looking at them in more detail later, but how do you react to them? And then secondly, um, very important question, to what extent do you think that Jesus was, in fact, what Ken Bailey calls a metaphorical theologian? Where might the limits be on his argument? Just a couple of minutes, um, just so that I'm not doing all the work tonight, just to get your juices flowing. Can I just say, over the course of the next few days, I'm going to be saying quite a lot, turn to your neighbour and have a conversation. Now, I am married to one of the world's strongest introverts. And I know that if I said to my husband, just turn to your neighbour and have a little conversation, he would run out of the room screaming. So if you are that person, can I give you permission right at the start to say to your neighbour, look, it's not personal, I just don't want to talk to you. <laughs> if you will do much better thinking your thought on your own, um, please have my permission to do so. But if you would do much better turning and talking to your neighbour, then please do that too. So, question. To what extent do you agree with Ken Bailey? Um, to what extent do you disagree? Where are the limits that lie? And then we'll kind of um, pick that up again and take it a bit further on in a moment. Oh, you're really well behaved. You're not like English clergy at all. I say that in England and they carry on talking for the next five minutes. I was just contemplating while you were talking that I actually, I just want to know what some of you think. It doesn't, I know I've said I'm not going to ask you, but I really do want to ask you. So I'd really like three people um, to offer an observation. Oh, we've got, sorry, Jen. Um, this always happens. The next person who's going to speak is going to be the person at the front, I'm confident. Um, but I would just be really interested to hear different um, views on this. So after the first person's spoken, if you hold her a differing view, then it would be particularly interesting to hear. Can I have a differing view of what you said? <laughs> together? I'm sure you can. I, I uh, resonated with a lot of what you were saying. For example, the dramatic action. The idea of throwing a shoe at a yes. president of the United States, Middle Eastern mm -hmm. dramatic action, making a very specific point, still true today, mm -hmm. as it would have been in Jesus' time. On the other hand, Jesus also trains in the rabbinical style of argument. Rabbi X said this, Rabbi Y said this on this particular passage. And so there's a back and forth with um, philosophical rabbinical mm -hmm. debate, and we see it articulated where Jesus is debating in the temple, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. people comment on it, you know, how, how mm -hmm. can such a young person have such, such wisdom? Mm -hmm. The other thing is he's connecting with people who largely are illiterate and whose life experience is limited to, say, fishing, or agricultural cycles, or Jewish liturgical festivals, or paying taxes. And so the, the bridge wisely is starting with people's life experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's exactly, well, I still want to hear what other people think, but it's exactly my view of when Ken Bailey was talking about this. I want to say, I think you've just swung that pendulum a bit too far. Because actually Jesus does engage in philosophy. It's not Greek philosophy, but it's very much rabbinic philosophy, as well as this dramatic action. And so in my, my question is, within our modern context, actually how do we weave together both 
the dramatic action, the parables, those kind of ways of exploring with the more philosophical modes that we're more comfortable with. I think what we've done is swung all the way through to a more Greek philosophical way of engaging with people. Actually, what would it look like if we swung a little bit back and had a few dramatic actions? Anyone else? Any other um, reflections, comments on that? You've probably been cowed now by a very excellent response. Go on, you know you want to. <laughs> so I worked in, uh, in an environment in a school. I worked with kids who were JK in grade six teaching in religious education. And I find that parables are actually uh, a very useful method of, uh, of speaking and sharing stories with them, partially because I frame around a riddle, uh, which really gets their imagination going. So one of, the, one of the ones that I do quite often is the parable of the sower and say, okay, here's the story that Jesus told, here's the first half of it, not the explanation. So what do you think these different pieces could be? What do you think they could mean? And then they just run wild with it. So, and, and, and really, it's, a, it's something very easy to be done in, um, in, in, in an adult setting as well. It's not restricted just to the kids. Because it is a different type of learning that engages the imagination and creativity in a very different way than straight didactic teaching. So uh, certainly my friend with the kids is really quite useful. Thank you. And that, I'm not going to ask anyone else to speak, because that is the perfect segue into what I want to say next. I'll pay you later. <laughs> because what you're reflecting is the fact that your children with whom you're engaging mostly don't know the right answer. Um, and the problem is that the vast majority of our congregations do know the right answer. As in, what does this story mean? let me tell you what this story means. It has a single answer, and I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, and that is where we begin to get bound in our um, stuff about parables. So, um, one of the really interesting things that happens as we become what you might call more sophisticated in the faith, you might want to call it something else, but let's call it more sophisticated for the sake of argument, is that actually we so often interpret parables as though they are absolute allegories. So each one detail in the parable has one applicatory meaning. And it's almost as though there is a jigsaw to be done. You have succeeded with your puzzle task once you've worked out what each particular person, action, thing in the parable means. Um, and that automatically begins to shut things down. This is what Amy Jill Levine says about it. Down through the centuries, the parables have been allegorized, moralized, crystallized, if there is such a word, and otherwise tamed into platitudes. Too often we settle for easy interpretations. We should be nice like the Good Samaritan. If we stop with the lazy lessons, we lose the way Jesus' first followers would have heard the parables, and we lose the genius of Jesus' teaching. Incidentally, if any of you want any of these slides, um, Jen has them all, and we can make them available if you any, want, any of you want any of these quotes. Um, and it seems to me to be something really to stop and chew on is one of the things that we find the tendency of doing and when we're explaining the Christian faith is to give the answer. Now, don't hear me wrong, I'm a Pauline scholar. I like theology and I like answers. But I think often what we do is we give people answers to questions they haven't even thought of asking yet. And one of the challenges, I think, of engaging with people who are increasingly alien to the Christian tradition is the fact that we are providing them with a perfect answer, and they go, but I don't understand what your question is. I have no idea how this fits into my experience. And for me, one of the interesting things about parables is parables invite people into an experience and allow them to begin to formulate their own questions. So for me, the interesting question is, how do you begin to allow parables to live again? How do you allow them to be the expansive stories that the first um, followers of Jesus would have heard? But I'm sure you are all thinking, ah, but what about Mark 4? the parable of the sower. We've just heard it talked about um, already. And probably the most challenging bit of all of the parable narratives, which is the thing that Jesus says in between the parable of the sower and the explanation of the parable of the sower. This is what he says. When he was alone, 
Those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? It is the thing that Jesus says that causes most people to scratch their heads time and time again. I don't understand isn't the point that we are meant to make people understand. Isn't the point that we're meant to make it really clear. Now, I think there's something really interesting going on in what Jesus says there um, that I would just like us to stop and reflect on a little bit. And it's this bit in verse 11. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables. Not everything is told in parables, not everything is communicated in parables, but everything comes in parables. And for me, the really interesting question there is what did Jesus mean by everything comes in parables? If you think about the other parables, the ones for which Jesus does not conveniently provide us with an answer, um, but where he just leaves them hanging, what happens with parables is that if you are in the slightest bit engaged by the parable, what you do is you wrestle with it, you explore it, you follow your nose. And it's almost as though what Jesus is saying to the disciples is, everything comes in parables because what it does is it invites you in, invites you in to begin to explore and um, to question and to ask questions um, and to see where you get to and to wrestle and to struggle a little bit more. It's almost as though parables are invitational in the way that explanations are not. Another little bit to add on to the end of this, which I always find absolutely fascinating, just remember these words. Those who are outside look but do not perceive, listen but do not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. You may remember in this part of Mark's Gospel, Jesus then goes on and explains the parable, and then we read in Mark's Gospel, but he explained everything in secret to his disciples. At which point we breathe a big sigh of relief and go, well, it's okay then, isn't it? Because at least the disciples will understand what's going on. All will be well. The disciples get the secrets, the outsiders don't get the secrets, um, and things will kind of unravel in their own way. Until you read on in Mark's Gospel, you may never have noticed in Mark, but boats are a big deal in Mark's Gospel. Whenever you find a boat in Mark's Gospel, the disciples will be somewhere in that boat not understanding what's going on. Um, <laughs> it's a kind of characteristic motif of the Gospel. And Mark 4, Mark 6, Mark 8 all have boats. And they all have the disciples not understanding till you get to the final boat in Mark 8 where Jesus says to the disciples, this is my favourite comic moment, actually, in all the Gospels, because they've just had the feeding of the 5,000, then they have the second boat experience, then the feeding of the 4,000, and, and the third boat experience, and they're in the boat, and Jesus says to the disciples, remember the leaven of the Pharisees, and the disciples go, he's going on about bread again. Um, and you kind of get that kind of complete misunderstanding of what Jesus is talking about. He's got a thing about bread, and he's going on about it again. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? You can feel him going, ugh. But just notice, do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? Who were the ones who had eyes and didn't perceive, who had ears and didn't understand? They were the outsiders. All of a sudden we discover that the glorious insiders, who got all the secrets, have eyes to see and do not perceive, and ears to hear and do not understand. All of a sudden you suddenly realise that the ones you thought were the insiders are in fact the outsiders, and just possibly those who you thought were the outsiders are in fact the insiders. Because the interesting thing that happens in Mark's Gospel 
is between the first boat scene and the second boat scene, Jesus meets three outsiders, all of who comprehend who Jesus is. Then you have the second boat scene to the third boat scene, he meets two outsiders who understand who he is. Then you have the third boat scene and he meets one outsider. They're all people who are the Syrophoenician woman, um, the um, demon Gerizim demoniac, people who are deaf and dumb. They're all people who characterise, strictly speaking, as outsiders, who all of a sudden become insiders. And what you begin to realise is with what Jesus is doing with these parables and the question of the parables is saying, well, actually, who really counts as an outsider and who really counts as an insider? And the reason why I loved um, the comment of the person who was talking about schools is that technically your children are the outsiders and yet their engagement with the parables reveal themselves to be insiders. Um, how many of our congregations who consider themselves to be insiders actually reveal themselves to be outsiders by the way in which they engage with parables? So parables are a very interesting lens through which you can begin to understand something about a real engagement with who Jesus is and kind of a deep, heartfelt acknowledgement of the nature of Jesus and who he is. So um, we have a tendency to read the parables as though they are allegories. You probably know already that the etymology of the word parable comes from the Greek word para, which means alongside, and balo, which means to throw. So a parable is technically where you throw one thing alongside another thing, and you see what happens when the one thing speaks to the other thing. One of the problems we have is that, to a certain extent for us today, the parables have died. Because the point is that you're not meant to be able to understand why Jesus would put this one thing next to that one thing. You know when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like dot dot dot, um, the things he put alongside you're meant to go, I beg your pardon, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. How on earth is the kingdom of heaven like yeast? I'll talk to you in a moment about the parable of the mustard seed. But we're meant to go, what a stupid idea. How on earth could the kingdom of heaven be for a moment like yeast? Our problem is we go, absolutely, kingdom of heaven just like yeast. I see it entirely. <laughs> and we no longer do that moment, that moment that says, eh, what's that all about? And because we don't do the moment, we can't enter the parable anymore. We can't actually engage in the sh surprise, the shock of what's going on in the parable. So fascinating question, if we want to begin to become more of a community that explores parables, is how do we make them alien again? How do we make them surprising, shocking, a little bit horrifying? Um, how do you begin to do that when you're beginning to explore parables? Um, I love this, um, that, Kenneth Bailey um, talks about when he's talking about parables. A metaphor is not an illustration of an idea. It is a mode of theological discourse. The metaphor does more than explain meaning. It creates meaning. A parable is an extended metaphor, and as such, it is not a delivery system for an idea, as in, he's arguing it's not an allegory, but it is a house in which the reader or listener is invited to take up residence. They are urged by the parable to look on the world through the windows of that residence. It's a rather lovely image that what we're meant to do is Jesus says, when you're living your life, you've got your experiences in this way, you've got issues that you're struggling with, come into this house and now look at your issue through the windows of this house. How does your world look different? How does God look different? How do your relationships look different? Live in this house for a while and look through the windows and see how the view looks different as a result of being in this house for a while. And I think it's a rather lovely image. It doesn't entirely do it. And again, this is where I don't entirely agree with him um, because actually Jesus himself does, of course, explain a parable as an allegory. So you can't say you cannot do it at all. But nevertheless, it is striking that only one of the parables is explained as an allegory and the rest are left for us to struggle with, to wrestle with. And I love the idea of going into a parable and gazing through the windows as through the windows of a house and seeing how the world looks different once you've done that. So the key issue when we're thinking about parables 
is actually what we place alongside the parable. How do we begin to start placing things alongside parables again today in a way that makes them make more sense, that inhabits the house, that begins to allow people to see through the windows in a new and interesting way? So, um, some questions for good parable reading. How do we resurrect parables? How do we stop them being dead? and start them being alive. And it's my question, really, for the next two sessions. Actually, how do we resurrect them? How do we kind of breathe new life into them? Let me just give you um, one illustration of a way in which scholarship has recently brought a, a parable to life in a way that I think is really quite interesting. The parable of the mustard seed, the well-loved parable of the mustard seed. We all know it, and I have heard more sermons on the parable of the mustard seed than I've probably eaten Sunday dinners in my life. Um, the parable of the mustard seed um, is a very striking one, in that, and people tell it as though it's such a lovely story, don't they? That the kingdom is like a tiny seed. And although you can't really see the tiny seed very well, um, the seed grows up into a really lovely bush, and all the birds come and they nest in the tree, and they sing lovely songs, and it's really great, and it's just what you want. Wrong. If you read Pliny, who um, was a natural historian in the Roman world, what Pliny will tell you about mustard seeds is that they are a pernicious weed. Um, the very last thing you want anywhere near anything that you're going to grow is a mustard seed. Because they are, I don't know, do you have mint here? Um, and is mint the same as it is in England? You plant it in your garden and you will have it in the entirety of your garden within two years and you'll never get rid of the stuff. That's what mustard is like in the ancient world or in the Middle Eastern world. It's still like that today. And the problem with a mustard seed is it's really tiny. And in an ancient agricultural context, when you can't have nicely sterilised seed, you take your hand of wheat, um, and you've got to bear in mind that um, in um, Mark's Gospel, at any rate, no, Matthew's, sorry, Matthew's Gospel, um, the parable of the mustard seed comes immediately after one of the other parables about sowing your wheat field, so you're meant to have your wheat field in mind. You take your hand of wheat, you don't notice you've also got your mustard seed in your hand, and you sow your wheat in your wheat field, and the tiny mustard seed grows up into a great whacking tree, a huge tree. And when you are growing your wheat in your wheat field, what is the very last thing you want in your wheat field? Birds. So the mustard seed grows up into a huge tree that gives shelter to the birds that are going to come and decimate your wheat field. That's what the kingdom of God is like, <laughs> says Jesus. And it's a great interpretation of the parable. The kingdom of God is vastly inconvenient. It grows quickly and it attracts all the riffraff you do not want to have in your nice ordered world. That's what the kingdom of God is like. It may not be the correct interpretation. There may be other interpretations of the power of the mustard seed. But I tell it to you because it illustrates what happens when you shake the parables. And we do the opposite of what Amy Jill Levine was just saying. We take away the lovely, platitudinous, bland reading of the parables and realise that actually what Jesus is saying is, you know, the kingdom of heaven, it's really inconvenient. Um, it brings with it a whole load of things you don't really want. And then you begin to realise that actually what you've got to do is wrestle a little bit and say, well, actually, what does it look like for the kingdom of heaven to be like a mustard seed? And the question is, how do we begin to reinvigorate all the parables in a way that actually allows them to be that voice that speaks into us, that disturbs us, that challenges us? I would say that the rule of thumb basically goes for interpreting parables if you are tempted to go, ah, oh, that's nice, at the end of the parable, you've probably interpreted it wrong. <laughs> what you should do at the end of a parable is feel really uncomfortable. Um, if you're feeling really uncomfortable, then you may be somewhere in the ballpark of a good um, interpretation of it. So how do we do that again? How do we kind of reinvigorate them um, is the big question, really, um, of the, the, the week that we have together. Here's a more complex question, um, and there will be a variety of views in the room on, in an answer to this. 
Can parables have more than one meaning? Can they have a bigger meaning than just a symbol one? Um, I will reveal myself early on in the week and say, I think they can. I think, in a way, what happens is parables are a house through which you can see the world, and actually, as the view changes, you see different things as you go through. Um, there are interesting questions to ask. Think about the parable of the sower. Can the parable of the sower have more than one reading, or has it only got the one? Are there differences in parables? Are there some that have one, some that have more than one? Personally, I think the parable of the sower even can have more than the one meaning. And what I want to do is illustrate to you tomorrow morning and afternoon actually how the gospel writers themselves change meanings of parables. And as the gospel writers change meaning of parables, actually how we might need to reflect on how parables themselves change meaning in different contexts, in the different way in which we tell them, and whether we can engage with them. But there are some people here, I think, who would want to say that parables only have one meaning. And I would be very interested in the conversation when we get there about how we begin to explore that together. Um, but I think there are some interesting questions to raise on that particular issue. In a way, we've asked this question already, but let me just ask it again. How do we help people see the world afresh through the windows of the parables that we read? The thing that I'm really convinced about is that in our task of proclaiming the gospel, in our task of engaging people within our Christian communities as well as outside of our Christian communities in the glorious joy of the love of God, that actually um, it is the parables that open up a world of meaning in a way that other things um, don't. And I say that as a passionate Pauline scholar as well. But I do think the parables give us something that other parts of our Christian theology don't. So the really interesting question is, how do we help people to see that? How do we begin to help people engage with those really significant issues um, that begin to change the way in which we see the world? Um, what happens when we start doing that? Can we begin to tell, start telling our stories in a different way? And a more challenging question, are you just stuck with the parables that Jesus told? Or should you contemplate telling other parables? Um, and how would you do that if you did that? Um, all sorts of questions which I hope we'll begin to have a conversation about um, um, over the next couple of days. Um, and then, I always think that for me one of the really important things about the nature of discipleship is that I cannot expect anybody else to do learning if I'm not doing learning. Um, I have to be at the forefront of the learning um, and then I can possibly expect other people to be learning as well. So therefore, how do I keep parables fresh? How do I begin to ask those questions? How do we begin to explore those issues? Um, and um, I think once we begin to kind of raise those questions and pull on the threads, we might get into some really interesting conversations. And my final just little bowl before we stop for the evening. What would a discipleship course look like if it were parable-based? What would it be like? What constituent um, ingredients might it need to have in it um, if it were to be more like the way in which Jesus engaged with people? You may remember, and we'll kind of pick up this um, um, again tomorrow, is that the vast majority of time when anybody asked Jesus a question, Jesus responded with another question. Um, and then when pressed, he then told a parable. Um, and so there is something, I think, in um, our reflection on the nature of discipleship and the nature of what we're doing within the Christian faith about being people who are good with questions and parables. But actually, what does that begin to look like? But it's really hot in here, and um, you've all had a drink and I haven't, um, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to my drink in a moment. I think the moment has come to stop there, um, and I hope we'll pick up our conversation tomorrow and see where we begin to follow our noses. But if you've got any questions and observations you want to make tomorrow, just make a note of them tonight, because if you're anything like me, they'll be gone by the morning. Then we can pick up the conversation in the morning. <laughs>